Today, we're taking a look at players with one-year primes that you completely forgot about, starting with Larry Sanders in the 2012 to 13 season. Now, Sanders wasn't the type of guy to go out there and get you 15 or 20 points per game. Instead, his main job was gonna be to get rebounds, block shots, and just play overall good defense for the Milwaukee Bucks. He came into the league in 2010, barely played coming off the bench most games, and then the exact same sort of thing in the 2011 to 12 season. That was until Andrew Bogut, their starting center at the time, was traded to the Warriors. This left the Bucks in a sticky situation at the beginning of the 2012-13 season, having to choose from much less talented players than Bogut to take over that larger role. They went with Larry Sanders, who saw a jump in playing time from around 12 minutes per game to over 27 minutes per game. He absolutely made the most of this time though compared to the previous season, improving his field goal percentage from 45.7% up to 50.6%. His blocks per game nearly doubled going from 1.5 to 2.8. Rebounds more than tripled from 3.1 to 9.5 per game. And lastly, his points went from 3.6 to 9.8 per game. This season was the only of Sanders' entire career that he had a positive plus minus when taking a look at his overall season stats, along with his value over replacement player being the highest it's ever been as well. He even dropped his only triple-double that season on November 30th, 2012 against the Timberwolves. 10 points, 12 rebounds, and 10 blocks for Sanders on that night. Now, following that season, Sanders struggled to stay on track, being suspended multiple times for marijuana use when it was banned in the league, and just never seeing the results that were ultimately desired. Now, I know that production increase was pretty crazy for Sanders, but it doesn't even compare to this next player's prime season. Mike James during the 2005 to 2006 season as a part of the Toronto Raptors. James averaged just under 10 points per game throughout his entire career. So what exactly caused him to jump all the way up to averaging double that for just one year? Well, first off, it was a contract year for him. He'd only been traded to the Raptors for one season before he was set to become a free agent again. Secondly, if you take a look at the roster that season, you could see there was not a lot of players who took many shots for Toronto other than Chris Bosh. James saw this as an opportunity, and rightfully so. Not only could he shoot the ball more than ever, but he was also seeing more minutes than he ever had in the past. All these factors combined led to him having a breakout season. He averaged 20.3 points per game, 5.8 assists, took 15.5 shots per game, and finished with a field goal percentage of 46.9%. James scored 35 or more points seven different times that season. Now, don't get it twisted, though. The Raptors were anything but good that season, finishing with a record of 27 and 55. But that didn't mean anything for James's sake. He was about to go sign the biggest contract of his life with the Timberwolves in the offseason. Four years, $23.5 million. Can you guys take a guess what happened after he signed with them? Yep, straight back to averaging 10 per game. It was highway robbery. James got his money and the Raptors got a one-hit wonder season out of the deal, while the Timberwolves were stuck holding an L. Next up is a player that many of you will know, but might have forgot he had a breakout season that was this good. Isaiah Thomas during the 2016-17 season. He was fresh off a year where he averaged 22.2 points, 6.2 assists, made the All-Star game, and led the Celtics to a playoff berth. This year that Thomas went crazy, most of the backcourt was made up of very young players. You had Jalen Brown, for example, in his first season. Terry Rozier, it was his second year. You get the point. Those guys needed a veteran presence to lead the team at the point guard position primarily, and Isaiah Thomas stepped up huge in that regard. The team was playing very average up until about midway through December, which is when they really turned it on. In fact, Thomas had a game where he scored 52 against the Heat, leading them to a narrow three-point victory on the 30th of December. He then led the Celtics to a first-place finish in the Eastern Conference with a record of 53-29. and Isaiah took a huge jump in points per game from the year prior, all the way up to 28.9, 5.9 assists, and shooting 46.3% from the field. But they weren't done there. Boston made it all the way to the Eastern Conference Finals before losing to the Cavaliers. In those playoffs, Thomas did everything he could, including a game against the Wizards in the Conference Semis where he dropped 53 points. That happened on May 2nd, 2017 which was going to be his sister's 23rd birthday until she tragically passed away in April of that year. He ended up dedicating that game to her, and I'm sure she would have been more than proud of him. After that year of Thomas 
pouring his heart out for Boston. They rewarded him by trading him to the Cavaliers, and he was never able to replicate the same level of success that he had in that 2016 to 17 season. Next up, we have a name that a lot of you probably don't remember. Bobby Simmons is on this list because of his performance in the 2004 to 2005 season. Simmons played for a bunch of different teams during his 10 year NBA career. The first two years, he was a part of the Wizards and did not see a lot of playing time at all. He came off the bench and averaged just 10.9 minutes per game over that time. Obviously, if you aren't seeing the floor a lot, it's going to be extremely hard to score a lot of points or just put up good stats in general. Something that really helped him when he signed with the Clippers in 2003 was that his minutes per game more than doubled. Even though he was still coming off the bench, this led to him scoring more points along with seeing an increase in every other major stat category. But that was nothing compared to the display that he put on in the 2004 to 2005 season. That year was the first time that Simmons was a full-time starter in the NBA. Although Los Angeles was pretty bad at the time, his minutes per game jumped to 37.3, he had a career best field goal percentage of 46.6, .6, a career high in rebounds per game at 5.9, and a career high in points at 16.4, which was more than double his previous season 7.8. All his efforts helped him achieve the most improved player award that season, which was great, but that was really the highlight of his entire career right there. Following his breakout year, Simmons signed with the Bucks, once again having a good season as a starter before hurting his ankle and missing the entire 2006-2007 season. After that, he couldn't escape the injury bug, it was mainly downhill, and his best seasons were well behind him at that point. Moving on to our next player up, kind of a similar situation to Bobby Simmons was Troy Hudson. He had his breakout year in the 2002 to 2003 season as a part of the Timberwolves. Up to that point in his career, Hudson had never started in more than 40 games over the course of a full season. I know it's shocking to hear, but once again, it's a case of a player seeing a bump in minutes and then all their other stats going up as well. A lot of the other guys on this list played very well for one season due to them playing on bad teams difference here was that Minnesota was actually good, and he got more playing time anyways. This was due to them severely lacking at the guard position, so Hudson stepped up huge right into that role and did exactly what they needed him to. He started in 74 out of 79 games that he played in, averaged 14.2 points per game, which was a massive increase compared to his 4.8 from just two seasons ago, and dished out 5.7 assists per game. All his efforts played a huge role in them finishing the season 51-31 and, and making the playoffs. Unfortunately, the Western Conference during that era was very cutthroat, so they ended up going against the Kobe Bryant and Shaq-led Lakers in round one. I do have to hand it to him though, Hudson did average 23.5 points throughout the six-game series against the Lakers, including a 37-point performance in game two and was the second highest scorer on the Timberwolves just behind Kevin Garnett. Once that season was over with, Hudson went back to that bench role for the remainder of his career basically, and never quite made the same impact that he did in that 2002 to 2003 season. From one point guard to another, let's head to Aaron Brooks. He pulled off his one hit wonder year during the 2009 to 2010 season with the Rockets. Similar to our last couple of players, this year was the first where Brooks played and started in all 82 games. It was really the perfect time for him to get more action because Tracy McGrady, who had led that team for many years prior, was on his way out the door, along with Yao Ming's foot injury keeping him out that entire year. That resulted in a lot of shots being open for the taking, and what better person for the job than Aaron Brooks. By the end of the season, Brooks had tallied up 19.6 points per game, 5.3 assists per game, shooting 43.2% from the field and a career best 39.8% from three. Although the Rockets didn't make the postseason, Brooks still got a lot of credit for his efforts winning the most improved player award that season. Once his famous year came to an end, he attempted to replicate that success yet again in the 2010 to 11 season, but sadly, he rolled his ankle very badly just five games into that season against the Spurs, and it really affected his career negatively after that. Kyle Lowry swooped in and took over his role at point guard, and things were just never the same for him. For the rest of his NBA career, Brooks bounced around like crazy, never truly finding another home. So we talked about Brooks starting in all 82 games during his best season. The opposite was actually true for Davis Bertans during the 2019-20 season. 
This was his first year playing for the Wizards after leaving San Antonio, and he came off the bench for 50 out of 54 total games that he played in. Heading into that season, Bertans was slowly improving year after year with the Spurs, but I think this one was more of a case of just a team that needed another scorer badly to somewhat give Bradley Beal a little bit of relief on the offensive end. Bertans' points per game increased nearly double from the year prior from 8 to 15.4, Rebounds increased slightly from 3.5 to 4.5, and I also noticed he started taking a lot more threes than he ever had in the past. This roster was also not good at all. I mean, they had tons of different players rotating in and out, left and right, including Isaiah Thomas, actually, who made an appearance on this list earlier on. Now, like we hinted at, Beal led them in scoring for the year with a whopping 30.5 points per game, but Bertans did finish second on the team. The Wizards, however, finished with a record of 25 and 47 that year, just to give you a better idea of what they were actually dealing with. Since that point, Bertans has spent time with multiple different teams, still coming off the bench most recently with the Hornets, but ever since that 2019 season, things have gone downhill. Let's move on to Dana Barros, who had his prime outlier year during the 1994-95 season. At this time, Barros was a part of the 76ers, and it was his second year with the team. Before he ended up on Philadelphia, he was yet another player in this video that came off the bench and only saw about 20 minutes of playing time per game during his time with the Supersonics. But the season we're talking about in this video, his minutes jumped all the way up to 40.5 minutes per game, which was second in the league that year. Barros played in all 82 games, when the most improved player of the year award saw a huge increase in points per game from 13.3 the year prior all the way up to 20.6 and finished that season averaging 7.5 assists per game. He also started a record that season by making at least one three-pointer in 89 consecutive games. All that effort was good enough to earn him a spot in the All-Star game along with competing in the three-point contest as well. Harris was always one of the better three-point shooters in the league, finishing off his career shooting 41.1% from behind behind the arc. You could mainly attribute that to his picky shot selection, which ultimately benefited him at least for stat purposes. But after that season was over in Philadelphia, Dana signed with his hometown team, the Boston Celtics. Once he got to Boston, the minutes that he saw in Philly began decreasing, and before you know it, he was back to being a full-time bench player once again. All right, this next one is a bit questionable because he didn't play that many seasons in the NBA, but it's Richard Dumas in the 1992 to 93 season. This year was legendary for him and the Suns because they made it all the way to the NBA Finals against the Michael Jordan led Bulls. For that season though, Dumas was struggling, not on the court, but off of it with drug abuse. The day before the 1991 92 regular season began, he tested positive for crack cocaine, which got him suspended for that entire year. So technically, the season we're talking about in this video was his rookie year. He only managed to play in 48 games, but during that time, Dumas stepped up huge for the team, scoring 15.8 points per game, grabbing 4.6 boards per game, and finishing the season with a field goal percentage of 52.4%. As I previously mentioned, him and the Suns made it all the way to the finals. Once they got there, Dumas actually played pretty well, even scoring 25 points in Game 5, leading the Suns to a 10-point win. But it wouldn't be enough to keep Jordan, Pippen, and the Bulls away for long as Phoenix lost that series in six hard-fought games. After that year was over with, Dumas fell right back into the cycle of using and was suspended for the entire 1993 the 94 season. It was very hard for him to focus on basketball at that time in his life, and he could never truly get it together enough to have a long career in the league. Now I want to move on to some names that you can't really classify as one season wonders, but they came pretty close and most of them are remembered for one certain year. So for these next couple of players, it won't be as in depth, just an FYI. A lot of people will say that Jeremy Lin is the perfect definition of a one season wonder and while I do see why they say that I don't know if I completely agree with that. That year with the Knicks in 2011 to 2012 is where he had his massive Lin sanity run. That was amazing and his most memorable stretch of games by far but Lin still had some good seasons after that with Houston, Charlotte and even Brooklyn when he was healthy. The reason that I left Lin off this list for main players to cover is because his stats didn't jump like crazy and then go right back down. He kind of maintained that certain level of play for many years. Whereas these other names that we covered earlier, that wasn't the case. 
Another name that you're going to see thrown around one hit Wonderland is Michael Carter Williams during his rookie year. That 2013 to 14 season was clearly his best and nobody is denying that. Winning rookie of the year, coming close to dropping a quadruple double in his first ever game and he set a ton of 76ers rookie records. But for about two years after that, there was a similar level of play from him. Not saying it equaled year one by any means, but it wasn't an immediate fall off from one season to the next. I will admit I was pretty close to throwing Devin Harris on this list due to his uptick in performance during the 2008-2009 season with the Nets, but I decided to go against it because he kept playing well for about two seasons after that before eventually declining. That one year for Harris was the only time he made it to the All-Star game though, and once again, I don't think many people are arguing that it was his best year in the NBA. Similar situation for our last name on the list today, Devontae Graham. I didn't want to fully say that he was a one season wonder with the Hornets just yet because he's only spent five years and some change in the league so far. But at the current point in time, he's barely seeing the floor with San Antonio and it doesn't look like he's heading in the right direction at all. Hopefully for his sake, he does make a comeback though. Now, if you guys enjoyed this video, make sure to of course subscribe and check out these other videos that I think you'll definitely enjoy.